Hello and welcome to this special roundtable on the new STS database. I'm joined by our, our STS experts on the database. My name is Vinay Badwar from West Virginia University in Morgantown and I'm humbled to serve as the council chair for the uh, Council on uh, Quality, Research and Patient Safety. And I'm joined to my right by the uh, 2020 president of the STS Joseph Duraney from Mayo Clinic, Felix Fernandez uh, from Emory University, the Chair of the Workforce on National Databases, Diana Alejo, our special guest as the um, uh, uh, Head of uh, Informatics from Hopkins and a data manager herself and a leader within the data manager community within the STS, and John Morris, the um, Vice President of IQVIA our data warehouse. I'm going to start this discussion uh, at the high level and talk about uh, the value of the database and the functionality of the database and some of the goals and objectives as we um, roll out this new version of the STS database. So first question, uh, Joe, uh, this has been a labor of love for the last couple of years <laughs> as we've uh, uh, looked at innovating the database. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to SDS and what does it mean to the specialty of CT surgery? Thanks, Vinay. This is a, a, a great way to kick off the discussion. So it's been a labor of love for us for two years, but it's been a labor of love for the STS for like 30 plus years. And the, the STS database is, as I think all of us know, it is viewed as the sort of benchmark database in all of healthcare. Uh, and in a large part because there's almost near all participation with all centers involved with cardiac, thoracic, and congenital heart surgery. Uh, it's become the marker for performance, it's become the marker for quality improvement initiatives, and it's become a marker for research. And now we have a platform that's going to enable us to do all those things much more efficiently, much more timely, and it will be real time. So it really truly is a, a trusted database that has been transformed now to uh, current times that it's going to make it easier for everybody involved and it will help mostly our patients. Excellent. Felix, um, you're one of the leaders in this entire initiative. Um, tell us what it really means and for the end user, uh, how are we going to roll out this new database? Well, uh, thank you, Vinay. So, um, as you mentioned, we're ready to roll out this database uh, right now and um, what uh, our participants and data managers uh, are, are going to see are several uh, new functionalities that, it's, that will make it easier uh, to upload clean data and use uh, your data in a meaningful way in real time. So uh, the first functionality is a 24-7 cloud-based platform. So what this will let you do is essentially upload, uh, manipulate, and download data in real time. Uh, our, our participants will have access to interactive dashboards. Now these dashboards will present uh, your data as they are entered uh, into the database and you'll be able to drill down to specific patients, risk factors or outcomes uh, of interest and these of course will all be compared to the STS benchmark data. For our data managers, they will have uh, enhanced data quality reports as the data is entered, they will get immediate feedback uh, on their data quality and they'll be able to drill down uh, to specific uh, data quality issues which will just further enhance the already high accuracy of the STS data. And finally, coming uh, this summer in July, there will be an uh, option for web-based uh, data entry at, at no additional cost to our participants. And what this lets you do is uh, perform data cleanup as you go, so it will also be a, a significant uh, enhancement. Excellent. Uh, John, I'm going to ask you something. You know, a lot of people worry when you send data up into the cloud right. that is it secure? Yeah. And part of this initiative and part of the reason it's taking time is that the STS wanted to really make sure that the fidelity and data security was at the absolute highest levels. Right. Tell us a little bit about how that's assured. Yeah, so there's a number of things, and I think one of the critical things, especially when you do cloud-based applications and design, 
uh, a key thing is to be able to get encryption of the data both at rest and when it's being transmitted. So essentially, whenever anybody is entering data or interacting with the system, they're interacting with encrypted data that essentially is secure both at the time it's created and as it gets uploaded uh, to the cloud. Uh, a critical thing, you know, uh, IQV is 65,000 folks who are working around the world, uh, pulling applications and these kinds of workflows together. And so being able to work, and we, ho we host and run a number of large programs uh, in our cloud environment, being able to do the right workflow, get the right user experience, but then make sure that there's fidelity and that the, the data itself is encrypted, protected, and secure is a critical piece of the application. That's a part of the design principles. That's baked in uh, from day zero. We are excited as well uh, about not only the web-based uh, data entry options, but being able to go and bring novel applications, novel analytics to the STS data. So this platform opens up a whole range of things for us, including you know, AI and ML opportunities to begin to look at what we can do around streamlining data and data elements, being able to look at, at new other components as well, like patient reported content and how we can integrate patient reported content. So the platform gives us that capability. It's a strong foundation to build on. Uh, we've got folks literally 24 seven, just as it's up 24 uh, seven, we have folks 24 seven working with the team. So we're excited to be part of that. Well, thank you very much. It's, it's a, having security in the data becomes so important. Yeah. And you've just outlined the potential future malleability Absolutely. and flexibility of how the data can then be utilized yeah. and where we could potentially go from here. Agreed. Uh, and, and I'll just say, just going back to for Dan and the folks too, it's so critical right now because the workflow around the data managers upload data quality reports, missing variable, yeah. being able to get that at the time that you interact with a particular record, not having to wait, but essentially bring that forward for fidelity. And again, it changes the workflow a bit, but it's a great segue into it. Keep, it keeps it quite accurate. Absolutely, yeah. So, so Diane, you, you know, you're, you've been a, a tremendous leader over the years as the database has developed and expanded and we bring in more data managers and other leaders around the country. Tell us what this potential transformation uh, means to the data managers and to you. Well, thank you. Um, I think it, it's going to be a transformation for data managers in their workflow, and I think it's an exciting opportunity um, to be able to leverage this new platform, um, integrate it into your workflow, and uh, meet the end goal of delivering high quality data metrics to improve quality at your hospital. Data managers are committed to collect and extract accurate data because they know the importance of the data and how it's used to impro improve the, uh, the care of our patients. I think IQV and the STS have invested a phenomenal amount of resources in really making the system um, complement the, the old way of how we used to clean data with the DQ report, but the new process allows you to actually get in in real time and dig into your data, uh, focus on what's important in terms of the risk metric variables, uh, your NQF performance measures. So I think it's really going to enhance them. They can spend more time working with the output of the data than cleaning up the data because they'll have real-time opportunities to do that. Well, maybe I'll ask you a follow-up question because you know, part of the concern when we talk about management of uh, a quality program within your institution uh, and costs associated with that, um, there's some fees associated with participation, but the vast majority, particularly in bigger programs such as yourself, um, is, has to do with the amount of time people spend and the, uh, the efforts that go into that and how many people you have to then hire because it takes so long. What does this potentially mean to institutions and potentially to your program and for all programs that the data managers t tend to spend a lot of time um, with this? Tr how does this refine things? So I think on two, uh, on, on two ways, um, it's going to refine and enhance. I think the uh, interactiveness of um, the whole data quality process in terms of importing your data, getting real-time feedback, allowing to drill down to the record level is very intuitive and um, going to um, make it much more easy to clean up your data more frequently, not wait to get a, a, a feedback report um, before you can actually go to the next step. And then the future of IQVIA in terms of integration uh, with the electronic medical record, I think that sets the stage that data managers can focus on the data and the analytics of the data and um, 
when the time comes where we can import data from an EMR, uh, copy and pasting lends itself to some data entry error, but I think having the confidence that that integration in the future is going to change it, so data managers are going to be more engaged, and I think also this platform, more importantly, is going to get surgeons more engaged in the data and the analytics. And the resources at, at an institution and participating in the STS database, it's not just purely chart abstraction, it's actually using your data and engaging a physician champion to uh, look at your data and use it to improve um, processes, Excellent. to improve quality. Thank you so much. Um, Felix, uh, we're, we're planning a phased rollout. So um, the initial phase is really essentially being able to do the uploader function, data quality report, missing variable report, and the dashboard function, initially with unadjusted data compared to STS benchmarks, but in a very short order. The, the, the whole data set is live now, and it's already been developed for the second phase. Tell us what that second important phase is like and what it means for our users. Yeah, th thank you, Vinay, and I'm, I'm just gonna go back uh, to the phase one that, that you mentioned. Um, the, you know, the pillars uh, of, of the database are, are the fidelity and the security, as has been mentioned. And um, that's why the database is trusted. And that's what phase one rollout is all about, uh, transitioning that trust, that fidelity and security to the platform. Then we bring all the exciting functions. With phase two implementation is when there is bi-directional exchange with our analytics center. And what that means to our participants is that's when you start to see risk-adjusted outcomes presented on the database, your risk-adjusted outcomes in comparison to uh, the STS benchmark data and to like groups. But it, it really doesn't stop there. As John mentioned, this is not a static uh, uh, platform, and that's the really exciting thing about it that uh, further enhancements and innovations can uh, continuously be implemented into uh, this platform as they are developed to meet the needs uh, of our participants, our, our patients, and really to tailor it to each of our uh, component database registries, the, the adult cardiac, the, the congenital and thoracic databases. Yeah. I think it's a very exciting phase. It's going to change how we interact with the data and the experience for the user and for the surgeon and for the hospital client. Uh, so as we start to think about, as John had nicely mentioned uh, earlier, in terms of the, this is basically a beginning. And, it's, and from this, we can morph into other exciting changes as we transform the data and healthcare and part of that is artificial intelligence, machine learning. Uh, Diana mentioned uh, the early parts of that, of just data abstraction. But maybe I can ask uh, Joe DeRainey, who's been an expert in this area, on, on how the STS is positioning itself mm -hmm. with IQVIA, with this new platform, mm -hmm. on using machine learning and artificial intelligence to really transform data even further. It's great, Vinay and John. I mean, this is the, the opportunities for us are just limitless. So if we look at what the STS has contributed in, in the arena of evidence-based medicine and surgery over the last 30 years with a database, we now have a situation where we have a large number of data points that have been validated over the course of decades with audits, et cetera, and uh, we have the ability now to do machine learning, which I think, as all of us know, the ability to perform and accomplish successful artificial intelligence and machine learning requires a large number of data points that have been validated. And so while there has been some frustration over the years with our, with our membership with the unwieldy number of variables that we have in the database, we have made a concerted effort to reduce them to some degree, but not too much. So it, precludes us from being able to do artificial intelligence, which is important because this is the next, I mean, intelligence-based medicine is the next level beyond what we currently do in healthcare. And, and for example, when we design a study and we want to answer a question, there already is inherent human bias because the variables that we enter into the equation are variables that we think are likely going to give us the answer. 
and, and the beauty of the computer doing it, and I think to your point, uh, uh, Diane, about the interface with the electronic medical record, which has been challenging at times, but it's just a matter of time before we can figure out how to combine the electronic medical record you know, with the database, we will identify variables that we never suspected might be playing an important role. And we would never have the ability to do that with the human mind. Uh, the computer has the ability to do that. So, so the STS database is actually ideally suited to, to really um, thoroughly and genuinely address machine learning opportunities because of the track record we have, you know, up to this point to start it. Yeah, and Joe, just you know, on that theme, you know, as you said, decades of precision with looking back with what's been done, the platform gives us now the ability to move and look forward and say, right. where are we going with it? That's right. right. So just this, this transition period, not only the data elements, the analytics, fidel you know, historical validation and fidelity, but now the ability to say, where are we going? Right. And be able to, and that's just a, a fantastic way to, to bridge it. So this is a really exciting time for the specialty of cardiothoracic surgery. Yes. I mean, we've already migrated 8 million yeah. records from the historical STS database into the cloud using the IQ via highly secure data platform. Right. We'll have it functionality, uh, the initial functionality being the data quality reports, real time Correct. accessible with initially unadjusted data but then moving to risk adjusted data real time. Correct. And then in July, the adult cardiac surgical database initially will drop its variables as the upgrade occurs by 34%, is that? 34% drop in, in the data elements. So we're then going to make the user functionality even more enhanced. Right. I'm sure the data managers are going to like that. For sure. And being able to upload it quickly. Mm -hmm. So this has been a really excellent conversation, um, and I think we're we're facing, Joe? Yeah, I was just going to say, as I was thinking about all these, yeah, I'm sure. so jazzed up about all this stuff. <laughs> um, one of the things I was going to say that I think is, is important for our membership to know and for the public to know is that if you look at the three specialties within our domain, adult cardiac, general thoracic surgery, and congenital, the two most common causes of death in this country are heart disease and lung cancer, and the most common congenital defect is a congenital heart defect. So I mean, this, this organization and our specialty, we are really ideally positioned now to answer questions and solve problems that will have the greatest impact in terms of the number of people affected um, when you look at these three different areas uh, uh, in, the, in the country and, and, and beyond. I couldn't think of a better way to close a jazzed president of the STS. <laughs> uh, so from the 56th annual meeting here uh, at the STS in New Orleans, uh, thank you for participating.